Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I think I've been meant to talk about community-based adaptation to climate change, but like Raoul, I've interpreted my brief fairly broadly. Um, and I want to start by reminding us of the global picture and links between mitigation and adaptation. I mean, it's really great the way that adaptation has risen up the agenda in a very major way over the last few years. Um, I remember being at a meeting in London in 2006, summer 2006, at which we had Al Gore come and speak about his film and everything. And I remember asking a question about adaptation, and he looked completely blank. And he said, well, I think we've got the CDM, haven't we? And I think we've come a huge distance over that um, three years in terms of the profile that adaptation has, um, particularly within the, no the negotiation process. Recent science, and particularly if you want to pick up on some of this, there's the Copenhagen Science Conference that took place in um, early May, I think. Recent science tells us that we must stabilize greenhouse gases in the next five years and then start cutting seriously if we're going to limit global warming to a reasonable probability of staying below two to three degrees by 2050. We had had a max goal of two degrees Celsius. That had been the goal for the EU and a lot of campaigners, um, less than two for um, small island states that are particularly threatened. But this now looks hopelessly over-optimistic, given that the last few years of emissions have been rising even faster than the business-as-usual projections assumed by the IPCC. And if you want to pick up on some of the, the data that lies behind that, there's an excellent guy called Bill Hare at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research. He's got some very good um, graphics that give you a sense of how, how far above the line we are. There's therefore a two to three degree warming that's now inevitable over the next 30 years, whatever we do about cuts in emissions because of the time lags involved. And some people like uh, Bob Watson, who used to be chief scientist at the World Bank, but he's now um, one of the UK um, scientists, says that he thinks we should be preparing for a four degree warming, and that that should be the basis on which we um, plan and manage. Martin Parry, who's the lead author of the IPCC working group on impacts and adaptation, has produced a collection of papers recently, which we're, we're publishing in August, um, which looks at costs of adaptation. It looks at the range of different adaptations and then the costs of trying to address those adaptations. And the figures that he's coming up with suggest that the figures for dealing with adaptation may be out by a factor of five or ten. That's to say that the rough estimates that were produced by Stern, by UNDP, by the UNFCCC, and by Oxfam of anything between 30 billion to 170 billion dollars per year by 2030 may need to be multiplied by a factor of five or 10 in practice. And it'd be interesting to see what the World Bank report, which is due out, I think pretty soon, um, these reassessments of the adaptation costs um, It'll be interesting to see what they say and, and the extent to which they bridge these earlier estimates and the estimates that Martin Parry is coming up with. What Parry also does is to remind us that there are limits to adaptation. That in most cases, that there will be a residual element that you can't just finance away and that which you can't protect against. Nick Stern, in his new book called Blueprint for a Safer Planet that came out er earlier this year, says or estimates that cutting greenhouse gases out of our economy will cost round about 2% of GDP 
if we want to keep below 500 parts per million of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 2% of global GDP, it's a significant sum, but not out of proportion in relation to the amounts that you might spend on insurance in a variety of other sectors. I don't know about you, but my insurance premium for the car is quite a lot above 2%. That might have something to do with the fact that I've got three young people in the family learning how to drive, but even so, a certain percentage it's worth paying in order to avoid a catastrophic event. So current adaptation estimates are well below this figure of 2% of GDP, which has led some people to argue that mitigation is too expensive. What we should be doing is to adapt as we go along, because that would be much cheaper. And people like Nigel Lawson um, and some writers on The Economist follow that line. But that seems rash, partly because we seem to have greatly underestimated adaptation costs, according to Parry, and partly because the longer we wait before cutting hard, the more extreme and unpredictable the global climate may become. So, to my mind, there are two key elements to effective adaptation. One is to mitigate hard, so there's a greater chance of keeping to a lower level of overall warming. And the other is to identify sources and mechanisms for delivery of funding and other support to help adaptation happen in diverse forms and at different levels. As anyone who's involved in the climate change negotiations will know, there's a certain amount of debate on many of these things at present and a whole number of different options being considered for how to raise additional money for adaptation. Should we be using some of the levies associated with the auction of emission trading permits? Should we be putting a tax on bunker fuels or on aviation fuel? Should we be resurrecting the Tobin tax? which? gets resurrected from time to time but still hasn't happened. And who should be managing that money? Should it be the GEF? Should it be the World Bank? Should it be the UN's adaptation fund? What should be the various channels through which that money is passed? Should it be new and additional to overseas development assistance? Or should we just shift aid into um, adaptation? So where does uh, CBA, community-based adaptation, fit into this bigger picture? Well, as somebody who's worked a long time in the West African Sahel, I would argue that we've been doing community-based adaptation for the last 20 or 30 years, because the West African Sahel is a region that has suffered very substantial periods of drought through the 70s and 80s, and where people have had to develop lots of different ways of coping with those changes. And I think it provides, if you like, a very interesting canvas to look at the sorts of things that work and the costs associated with that, that process of adaptation. So community-based adaptation, to me, builds on a very long development tradition which emphasizes the importance of bottom-up approaches, Approaches that harness the knowledge, energy, and cultural strengths of particular groups and communities who understand very often their local context best. I remember when I joined IID in 1987, there was a great wave of evidence coming out from dozens of projects showing the importance of combining local and outside knowledge, embedding the process and choice of changes within local communities themselves rather than doing development for them and with a very strong focus on participation. I don't know, some of you are much too young to remember all of these things, but there were books like The Greening of Aid, The Greening of Africa. There was Asif Sheikh did a wonderful collection of studies looking at um, successes in the Sahel. There was Rene Rochette did the same thing, Robert Chambers equally. So there was a real flowering, if you like, of experience from 
local level success stories and what that meant for broader principles. And I think many of those broader principles remain very important as we take forward a, a community-based approach to climate change adaptation. Now we can see some of the results of those approaches in the great spread of uh, soil and water conservation technologies and of agroforestry across the West African Sahel. And I thought I'd just give you a few examples of the, of the transformation that's taken place in some parts of the Sahel, such as the central plateau of Burkina Faso, which have really been transformed in the last 25 years through a mixture of very simple techniques around um, protection of trees and of um, small water catchments that allow what rainfall does fall to be held in place and to help plant growth rather than running away. This is in southern Niger, the Maja Valley. Very often these techniques are remarkably simple but um, and are based on traditional techniques that have been improved but with quite substantial improvements in um, productivity associated with them. Much, much successful community-based adaptation depends very much on getting the right mix of local and outside technology combined. Not, so it's not just technology, but you need to combine this with social, economic, and institutional systems that support better, better practices, better land use. The principal impacts of climate change come from a range of things, including rising temperatures, changes in rainfall, and increases in extreme events um, alongside sea level rise. These are some of the floods from, from Mozambique. Together, these impacts will be felt particularly um, on agricultural production. And the, this is a comparison of the estimated um, percentage of failed cropping seasons in different parts of Africa between the situation today on the left-hand side and the situation on the right. And you'll see um, quite a lot more yellow on the right that suggests a much higher probability of crop failure in 2050 than we have today. And those changes in agricultural production are the consequence of changes in water availability, um, changes to plant cover and biodiversity, uh, changes to health vectors, changes in pests and pollinators. So if one thinks about how to enable communities to adapt to climate change, it's essentially, as Raoul was mentioning, all about building more resilience into food and water systems, ways of strengthening diversity within both biological but also livelihood systems, and proactively addressing health risks. But like all community-based initiatives, it can't all be bottom-up and you need to nest that community-based approach in a set of measures that also um, need to consider higher levels. If you take things like squatter settlements, which is a, an area that IID has done a lot of work in over recent years, particularly looking at the impact of climate change on informal settlements, their options for adaptation, including relocation or upgrading of their homes will need to be set very much within a bigger city plan into which they can feed. Or take water. Many rivers span a number of countries and can't be managed by each government in isolation. Look at the River Niger, for instance, which starts in the mountains of, of Guinea and then inexplicably turns its back on the ocean and heads up and into um, the desert lands of Mali and Niger. It is an absolutely vital lifeline for those countries. 
There's lots of uncertainty about future rainfall in West Africa. Some of the climate models suggest that rainfall might fall by 20%, whereas others say it might increase by 20% over the next 30 or 50 years. But both scenarios would have major implications for how the, how the river is managed, how many dams should be built, how to allocate water between irrigation, hydropower, domestic, fishing, transport, and other uses, and how to allocate water between upstream and downstream countries. So adaptation to climate change around these big rivers very much needs to take that sub-regional perspective. Or take food security and global trade in foodstuffs. I think all of us, and particularly here at IFRI, um, you've been looking and commenting on the food price spike of 2007 and 8, which has generated some very powerful changes in behavior at global level. It's accelerated the acquisition of land for large-scale agricultural investments by food importing nations in other countries where land and water is more abundant. We recently completed the first detailed survey of such large-scale land acquisitions in five African countries, and you can get it off the website, but there's also a copy or two to hand around here for people to look at. We found the picture very much more mixed than the sort of headlines land grab might suggest, which we were reading in the press. We found a much wider range of countries and actors involved, not just China and countries in the Gulf, but also countries like Libya. Even the island of Mauritius is buying land in Africa. And it's not just sovereign wealth funds, but many private companies as well. And it's not just foreign investors, but domestic elites as well in those countries. And in many cases, it's been less the acquisition of land, but more the acquisition of water that's been a key variable in the choice of, of site that um, people have been going for. This process of large-scale land acquisition can be seen, I think, as one means to adapt to climate change, but operating at this global level. And in practice, it may well be far more damaging to the livelihoods of rural people in the near future than changes to temperature and rainfall. The scramble for increasingly scarce resources is bound to damage the poor most, since they'll find themselves displaced from their land and water in favor of those who can pay. And I think a key question for IFPRI, IID, and others is, can some of these land deals be opened up to provide greater benefits? Can there be a process of, of greater scrutiny that will enable um, a wider set of interests to be brought into play? Well, maybe there might be some positive opportunities from climate change and adaptation that can be seized by poorer groups, because so far, um, things have been looking pretty negative. At the moment, the benefits from the carbon market and CDM have gone principally to large-scale producers of greenhouse gases, where transaction costs are low and verification relatively simple. So it's been, by and large, big factories in India and in China where you've been able to capture large amounts of greenhouse gases in one go. African countries, for instance, have gained less than 2% of CDM projects and finance. The prospect of forest carbon funding is also likely to benefit countries in Latin America and Asia, which can demonstrate effective forest monitoring and legal systems to assure investors of where their money is going. The prospect of large sums of money to pay for forest carbon also raises big risks that more powerful groups displace forest dwellers in order to get the pavement. And governments may well start to um, forbid people into forests for collection of fruit, leaves, grazing, and dead wood on the grounds that um, they're being paid to protect it. <laughs> 
The voluntary carbon market is one way to direct f funding to small-scale initiatives, partly because of the lower transaction costs and the less tight verification methods involved. We're in the process of trialing a, vol a voluntary carbon market product that tries to combine both mitigation and adaptation. We call it ADMIT. So it's meant to be a way to admit your responsibility for emitting greenhouse gases. And this product will then support projects where there's an element of both carbon storage and management, but there's also an element to try and help more vulnerable groups adapt to climate change by building resilience, whether in agriculture, water, energy, housing, or other infrastructure. So, to come back to the beginning, we see adaptation and mitigation as inextricably linked. The costs of adaptation will rise inexorably the longer we take to shift to a low-carbon economy. Adaptation will need its own funding source, which can support investments at community level, as well as at city, national, and regional levels. And we very much hope the Copenhagen summit will agree major cuts in greenhouse gases alongside agreeing a predictable, sizable fund for helping poor countries and poor communities adapt to climate change. And we see community-based adaptation as a key part of this. Thank you.